Sorry about that. I've got to pick this up a little bit. How do I do that? <laughs> there we go. Gotcha. Hello, everybody. Gosh, isn't it wonderful to see your faces here? I'm sorry I've not seen them before. I know you've been out in the dark, but that's not my excuse. Um, and I do applaud your legal, peaceful action. It is through your action that this travesty of a cull has uh, continued to find its way into the headlines, despite the fact that some sections of the media uh, have decided not to give it exposure. Um, you have ensured that oxygen has continued to flow to uh, the topic, and uh, I really do personally thank you and applaud you for all your hard work and indeed your sacrifice. I can't imagine what it's taken uh, to commit yourselves in such a practical way so often and for so much of your lives and time. Uh, which brings me to a point that I want to touch on a little later, and that is value, an intrinsic value uh, of life. But I don't want to go there right away. If, if, if I may, I'd just like to touch uh, on the very fabric of what this is about. Um, this is about bovine tuberculosis. It's a disease, we all know, uh, that profoundly affects uh, two major industries in the British Isles, the dairy and the, and the beef industry. And I do empathise with anyone who runs a business and finds it collapsing around their ear rolls. It's a horrible, horrible thing to happen. It's a devastating thing for, for families and for communities. And so I absolutely empathise with that. And that makes it all the more tragic that this travesty of a cull has deflected our attention from the problem. The problem is not badgers, it's BTB. And as long as this government and others continue to focus on badgers and spend time, energy, money and lives, of course, in the process of trying to tackle this very real problem, we will only see it at the very least remaining the same and if not being exacerbated and getting worse. And this brings me to what we must look at, and that is solutions. The solution to combating BTB in the British Isles must, of course, come from within the industry that it profoundly, uh, profoundly affects, the agriculture and the farming industry. And it must come uh, in a myriad ways, of course. What we can do immediately, we all know. We can work very hard towards changing the way we manage these farming practices through much tighter controls on cattle movement, much tighter controls on husbandry, and of course this extraordinary phrase biosecurity, which basically means stopping badgers snuffling alongside cows in feedlots. That's the, the bottom line. All of these things can be done. They cost money. Herein lies the rub. All of them can be done, but they do cost money. Let's come back to vaccination. Because vaccination in uh, a wildlife reservoir of any disease has been tried and tested uh, with many profound uh, conclusions and examples. Let's look at rabies in, in Europe for a moment. Rabies exists in continental Europe and it did so from the south and it started to spread at quite a re remarkable rate north. We're talking about a few decades ago here. And what did human beings do? They thought, well, what's the main reservoir for rabies? What's spreading rabies across uh, Europe? And they found foxes were reservoirs for this disease. And we all know rabies is a heinous disease. It affects every mammal, including ourselves. And so they started killing foxes by poisoning them. But that didn't stop the tide of rabies moving north. In fact, it made it worse. It happened more quickly. Because no one was looking at the ecology of the animal they were tackling. No one was looking at what happened to foxes when you started killing some in a community. And what we now know and refer to as the perturbation effect affects foxes in the same way as it can affect badgers. I'm going to come to badgers, of course, in a moment. So a little experiment was conducted in the mountains of Switzerland, because in those mountains you find these Y-shaped valleys. They've probably got a glorious name in Swiss German that I don't know. However, think of a Y. There's the beginning of the valley, and it goes two ways. And between the two are mountains that are effectively impenetrable to foxes. I'm not saying a fox can't trot over the top, but they don't. They trot through the mountain valleys. And here was an opportunity to vaccinate on one side of the Y and to kill on the other side of the Y. On the killing side, rabies spread, just as it had been, like wildfire, further north. On the vaccination side of the Y, it stopped in its tracks. Why? because the foxes stopped other foxes coming through. 
Now let's just look at what happens with badgers in England. And I use this phrase very specifically in England and indeed in Wales, because what we keep hearing from people who are only, frankly, they're misinformed. They're ignorant of the facts because they've been fed facts from other people. They're getting it poured into their ears. And I include Owen Patterson in this. So he's, whether we believe in him or not as a human being, he is acting on what he is being told is true. But what he hasn't been told and clearly hasn't absorbed is the fact that badgers in England and across the United Kingdom have a very unique way of holding their clan system together in very tight-knit communities with very, very clearly demarked boundaries to those communities. And the study that went on and continues to go on in Whitton Wood and Oxfordshire proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, because there is a small reservoir of BTB in some of the animals in that study group, the movement of BTB between clans of badgers in that study group over decades is virtually nil. So you have this little reservoir, and if you want to imagine it as a map, it's in the bottom left. And across the rest of the northeast and the whole of the top right, they've remained clean of BTB. Why? Because happy, healthy badgers stop other badgers coming into their community. What we know, without a shadow of a doubt, is if you start killing these animals, you cause movement. Now, I keep reading in papers, of it's actually misinformation in its own way. Badgers running terrified from the... No, they're not. No, they're not. What they're doing is that they're moving because there are vacancies and territories. And it depends on who you kill. If you kill a mature boar in a community, you are going to leave a much bigger hole, a social gap, than if you were to kill a youngster of the year. Now, I'm not saying we should selectively kill age groups here. I'm saying we shouldn't kill full stop. But the point is, you only need to remove one animal to run the risk of spreading the disease. Why does it happen that in other areas, it, when people start talking to me about possums in New Zealand, how phenomenally ignorant can you get an invasive species that doesn't hold territory or a clan? This is completely irrelevant. And yet it's used as a great big guiding light for what we should be doing in the UK. No, it shouldn't. It's completely and utterly irrelevant. Now, most people I speak to, and I speak to, I live in, I've always lived in the countryside and I live in a rural community. Most people I speak to who know that their badger communities are healthy say, oh, don't come and touch mine because I've got a nice healthy group and I don't want anybody to come in and start shooting them because I know I might get something sick in the midst of it. Fine. So let's think of vaccination first and foremost as the one and only way in the, in the wildlife reservoir to tackle BTB. And if it means, I know that what we're looking at here is a tip of an iceberg of volunteers who if we said, anybody prepared to go out and help, well, to, first of all to learn and help vaccinate badgers, how many hands am I gonna see? <laughs> Thank you very much. No shortage there. We're gonna get everybody out there. So there's no problem. At what cost? No. Well, what, did you say a quid? Okay. <laughs> Still, it's cheaper than 2,500 quid a badger, isn't it? So, one way or the other, we've got the workforce to achieve this. But even that, I'm sorry, I'm going to be slightly contentious, even that is a distraction because the problem is in the industry. And what we need to look at is making sure that within those industries, for their own sake and for ours, that we start to get to grips with it. Yes, vaccination can work. When we hear all the negatives about, oh, it's only got 40% efficacy, well, why did we all get the jab then? Excuse me. And just on a tangent, by the way, I was a positive reactor. I had a natural immunity as a kid, so I've got a lump and I'd have been shot. We're dealing with survival of the crappiest. No, seriously, we're dealing with survival of the crappiest. We're dealing with a completely flawed system. The testing is, com is very, very blunt instrument. We know that animals, cattle remain in herds undiagnosed and they do so for their entire lives not showing any signs of being particularly sick until they're slaughtered and they're found with a myriad lesions in their lungs we know this so it's a problem that is absolutely endemic in the industry we move more cattle over wider areas in this in this country than any other country in europe because we can't finish cattle as it's known, in the zones where they're, rain, uh, where, where, they're, where they're raised. And so they're moved to places like Carlisle and others for finishing, where there's a lot of food bringing them up to weight. Which brings me to the next point, and that is value and cost. And I am sorry, I, I'm sure many of you are vegetarians, men, some may well be vegan, but many of you too, and I include myself in this, are omnivores. I eat meat from time to time. I'm the consumer, we all are, and actually everyone out there is, and they are the people who ultimately decide on what happens in this. 
We are the people who ultimately decide because we are the people who drive this business with our money. We go in and we buy milk and we buy cheese and we buy butter and we buy beef and we buy whatever. If we continue to think that we can do this on the cheap, we are doing nothing other than fooling ourselves. The average household income, the amount and percentage spent in just after the war on food was about 50% of household income in the late 40s, early 50s. Do you know what it is now? It's about 11%. And still we think it's too expensive. The real cost in going to the supermarket and saying, oh, that's a pricey piece of chicken, I don't think well, I'm going to get the cheaper one. Oh, that's an expensive lump of meat, I'll get the cheaper one. Is exactly what you're seeing now. Is exactly what you're seeing. Because there is nobody out there who can run a business which is already on the edges of just about breaking a profit margin and continue to do so without somehow raping the very resource that we all know is so vital to life for ourselves. And that is the natural world. Now, we are being encouraged in this country to start looking at what they now refer to, and I'm afraid you're going to hear this phrase a lot, as natural capital, in pounds and pence terms. And one can do it. And there's a very brilliant book written by Tony Juniper called What Has Nature Ever Done For Us? that can do just that and begin to introduce you to the very real costs of cutting trees down in a city, of raping the, 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 the uplands, and, make, and then suddenly you find that there's floods in the, in the lowlands. And then, goodness me, it does have a real value. You mean you can put it into pounds and pence? Yes, of course you can. And if this is one way, this is one rhetoric that opens the doors to industry and where we can start to talk to business and say, look, there's a real value to having this woodland. There's a real value to having this marsh, this animal, this creature, because I can show you it on a balance sheet. Fine, if that opens people's ears. I'm not anti that. What I am anti is that being legislated for. Because the moment the power of that falls into the hands of the legislators, it can and will will be manipulated, just as it always has been in every business ever. And if suddenly someone says, oh yeah, but you know what, those badges actually are only worth 15 pounds and the bit that I want to uh, build is worth 25 million, then the badges lose. Value is intrinsic. You all get that. And I am so proud to see so many people who get that. It is, to me, an anathema. It's extraordinary that we have to prove in pounds and pence, the value of the very fabric of life that supports us. Most of us know it and get it, and by all means use those figures to support an argument, but don't please let it become legislated, because if we do, we will all lose. We will all fundamentally fail and lose. And this comes back to something that Bill referred to, the devaluing of natural resources, of the natural world. I. I am not a party political person. I am absolutely dismayed at every turn, having gone from the rhetoric of the greenest government ever, yeah, to what I now see on a regular basis of an insidious but rather crafty devaluation of natural resources. So suddenly, uplands are just wasteland. Animals like badgers that might actually cause a profound effect and the loss of billions. This word's used all the time. The, 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 the BCB does indeed cost the nation and farmers billions over the past 10, 15, 20 years. But what cost is there at the loss of the very natural fabric that supports us all? We have no idea of the implications of destroying that. And frankly, if we destroy the intrinsic value that most of us get, but bit by bit it's slipping away, particularly in cities, the more that kids are divorced from the real world, and they are, and they're locked into their PlayStation 2 or their Wii or their whatever, the more likely it is that they're going to look down and value everything by what it is they can buy with the paid day tenor, rather than getting out, getting muddy, and getting silent. I would like to see from here on some true value in silence, in getting people to get out. And I don't care, it can be in the middle of College Green, because if I sit a kid under that tree and I leave that kid who's eight years old for five minutes, they're going to find something beautiful. They will. It might be a leaf, it might be a ladybird, it might simply be the fact that a 
herring gull flies over and puts on their head. Okay, you can, maybe that's not beautiful, but it's going to affect them, and it's going to, they'll remember it forever. That's slipping away from us, and it's up to each and every single one of us to ensure that that does not happen. And we certainly don't let the policymakers allow that to take place and to become an insidious change and shift in what is intrinsic and extrinsic values in our society. Thank you very much.